So I want to welcome everyone to uh, this interview. This is an interview uh, for Bain's newest release, which is the What Price Victory um, uh, short story novella collection um, out recently um, in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook. Um, uh, joining me today, I have several of the major contributors to the book. I have uh, Miss Jane Linscold, uh, uh, Mr. Katu, Kat, Kat, ouch. Oh man, I already pronounced it. Oh, I'm sorry. Ouch. And uh, Miss Joelle Presby, and uh, of course Mr. Weber, uh, Mr. David Weber. So uh, the first uh, question, I'm Mr. Weber. Uh, it's been, by my calculations, about ten years since the last uh, World of Honor um, uh, collection came out. I think the last one came out in about 2013, uh, and I think this is like uh, we've done about seven now. So I wanted to ask, what was the like the inciting incident? What was the thing that caused you and Bain to decide to to publish this now? We remembered. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's really pretty much true. The, the hiatus was not really intentional. Uh, it got stepped on by other projects. Uh, it got pushed back. And then, of course, uh, we ran into COVID. Um, I had some health issues. I lost about really and truly between the face plant in Atlanta and the cement floor face, our you know, intimate uh, connection and concussion. And I was just about back up into the saddle after that when COVID put me in the hospital for 10 days. Um, and so I really, I really lost four years easily of, of production time. And that's a part of where this, this delay was. It was. There was never an intention to let them rest. It just sort of happened. Gotcha. Um, uh, was there... When I was reading, there's such great desperate um, type stories going on. There's like a uh, there's some kind of Clancy esque thrillers in here. There's a mystery, a murder mystery. There's kind of a, a family specific story. Uh, when you're planning these out, uh, do you have the styles already thought of, or do you specifically let each author make the decision? Oh, I'm pretty much except for being the the background guy. Uh, who says you can't do that because the tech has established that it works this way or no we have a hardwired historical situation in here that you can't change I really want to give anybody writing in the anthologies as much freedom as I can to write the kind of story that they want to write basically they pitch me the idea that they want to go with and I and especially uh Tom Pope, who I wish could be here because Tom is the nuts and bolts guys of the of the honorverse for me par excellence. Uh, but uh, so essentially, I know what the story concept is. We figure a place where we can fit it into the into the time stream if they don't already have one, and then I pretty much stand back and let them do their story. Uh, to me, that's the way that the collaborative process, and this is a collaborative process in a different format, the way that it has to work. All right. And then um, one question I wanted to ask specifically about the honor verse in general is, you know, there's, when you look up military sci-fi universes, you see a ton online. Uh, and it's, it's a really popular genre. There's a lot of e-books um, for it. Uh, but on the the honor verse for honor Harrington is very um, uh, very has great sales and there's been a lot of books in there and there's a lot of discourse online. What do you think is from your perspective the impetus for why it's so popular and has caught on so much? Because it's not about honor Harrington. Um, I mean, a lot of the stories are about honor Harrington and honor is. Trust me, I love this character. I had originally planned for her to die about halfway to where we are right now um, and ran into a situation courtesy of Eric Flint that pulled everything forward and meant that I couldn't. The bad side of that was that there's a period in the books where they kind of concertina while, because my original story concept won't work there's not enough time for the bad guys to develop the technology they were supposed to develop. So I had to kind of find my footing again in, in the middle of that. Um, but this, these stories are really 
all of them are about the honor verse, about the universe in which Honor Harrington and those around her live and, and do their thing. Now, there are individual characters in the honor verse, like Honor Harrington especially, like Nimitz, uh, like uh, Avars Terikoff, uh Alexander Whitehaven, that the stories are definitely about, all right? But the reason the anthologies work so well is that you can insert characters, you can insert incidents into the storyline because what you're really inserting them to is the universe. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and since Anthology 2, I've pretty much adopted a policy of making the short stories canon for the universe. So as, this, as the anthologies have developed, they've inserted additional DNA uh, into the series. And that's what screwed up my plans to kill Honor, because from the Highlands, uh, with, which Eric Flint did, um, just, it's like, oh wait, I don't have time for Honor to die and her kids to grow up to fight the Solarian League now. Um, I was, oh, broken hearted. Broken hearted. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. But I will say that the death scene that I had in mind, there would not have been a dry eye in the house when I was done. But I'm just as happy that I, I didn't have to do that. I think you may have may have had a uh, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle moment where if you had killed off your main character, you would have had some really angry fans uh, yeah, from that. Yeah, had, had, I would have had to introduce uh, pikas into the honorverse really quick. I <laughs> right. <think. laughs> um, Sorry, it's from a different. It's from another universe. From the safe old universe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, the last question I have for you before I move on to the other authors is, so uh, as you referenced, uh, Mr. Zahn and Mr. Pope, who wrote the first uh, novella here, Traitor, they are unfortunately were not able to be with us today, but I thought you might be able to provide a little bit of insight. So this is the, the novella that follows Cutler Vaughn, uh, is it Tischendorf? Uh, we pronounce it Teschendorf. Teschendorf. That's correct or not, I do not know. Okay, okay. Um, you follow Cutler uh, while a coup is happening against Gustav Andermann, and um, uh, which is a very, it's a very suspenseful story. Um, uh, as I was reading it, I, I didn't know which characters were going to be the good guys or the bad guys because I haven't gotten too far into the honorverse yet. So, and then the way it changes throughout was, I thought, great. Uh, can you talk about? what uh, editing insights you had and how the story may have changed from the first draft to the final draft. The story itself didn't change very much at all from the first draft to the final draft. There were some technical details that had to be adjusted. But Tim and Tom and I are doing a complete collaborative sub-series within the Honorverse, the mm -hmm. Manticore Ascendant right. uh, novels. And the Andermani, who are some of my favorite weird characters in the entire Honorverse, the ethnic Chinese Prussians. Uh, but um, Jensone, okay, Teschendorf becomes Jensone. He takes, I believe it's his mother's uh, maiden name uh, when he sets out on his own. And he is the leader of the mercenaries who tried to destroy the Star Kingdom in the second of the uh, Manticore uh, Ascendant novels. So this is, in a way, its backstory for a very important character. It's also backstory for the relationship that develops at this stage of their history between the Andermani and the Star Kingdom. Uh, these stories are taking place uh, about uh, 600 years, 400 years, 50, 600, somewhere in there, before Honor Harrington's time. So a lot of the relationships that are being built here have since dwindled, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but uh, if anybody is paying careful attention to the to the current novels, Avar's Terikoff's wife, he's an important character in, in the later Honor Harrington novels, is directly descended from Travis Lee and Chumps, and the family uh, yacht, is named the Kaiser's Gift, in case you're wondering how that particular relationship mm -hmm. has gone. <laughs> I, I thought this story was interesting because they introduced a lot of German terms, but just threw them out there and didn't explain them. And I'm doing German on Duolingo, so as I was reading, I was like, ooh, I know that one. Ooh, I can figure that one out based yes. off of this. So I did appreciate that uh, because the way it was doing it made me 
want to go research more of another language. And it made it interesting that even though you're reading, they may speak English in the book because this is for English readers, um, uh, you're still able to, to throw in other languages. Well, one thing that I'd like to say is I've known Tim for a long time. Uh, I've always really enjoyed his writing. And he actually did the short story that I hooked the entire Star Kingdom Ascendant series off of in mm-hmm. an earlier anthology. That was the starting point for that entire subseries. And I had always known that I wanted to work with a collaborator uh, on those earlier books because I wanted them to have a different feel from the Honor Harrington novels. And I also wanted them to be in the hands of someone who I trusted. I think Tim has probably been a little frustrated a few times there (laughs) uh, because he's working with Tom and me and neither one of us is exactly Teutonic in our precision to schedule keeping. Um, (laughs) But uh, it's, it's been fun. Okay. Uh, so the next, I'm going to go to Miss Lynn's Cold uh, to ask you about your uh, novella in here, which was called Deception on Griffin. Is that how you say it? Griffin or is it Gryphon? Griffin. Griffin. Okay, good. Um, uh, this, uh, my first question uh, as we're getting to that is, uh, I saw you've actually, this is not your first uh, novella that you've done. Uh, you've, uh, you contributed, I believe, to the second uh, worlds of honor how did you uh get involved in the in the honor verse had you uh, been a fan of the books beforehand well it's a complicated thing i think i've actually contributed to four or five of them um i was the godmother of the anthology series uh weber and i have been good friends since he had one and a half novels and i had one short story and he was visiting us in new mexico and we were having dinner with a friend, and I started talking about, you know, you guys really are, are spinning off here, and one thing led to another in the anthology series. So I contributed to, I think, the second, the third, and fifth, or something like that. Um, so, yes, I'm a fan of the Honorverse. I like it a lot, but I think, for me, my participation started with being friends with, with Weber rather than a fan. Um, I just want to say, one of the reasons that Jane was in one of the very early anthologies is she was the one person who asked me, was King Roger assassinated? She was the only person who had picked up on that, Mm -hmm. that that was what had happened to him. So she had picked up on it. So I said, yes, write the story. Um, And she did. The other thing that I should point out is that Deception on Griffin, is spun off from the young adult series that she and I are doing together, uh, the the Star Kingdom series. And the characters in the novella are established characters, the the, the young people and the Mm -hmm. three cats are established characters from those books. I, when I was looking at the uh, the wiki uh, online for this to, to get additional context and information, I did see that a lot of these characters had already been pre-established, uh, which is cool because as someone who's newer to the Honorverse, I'm still able to um, enjoy these stories as these are all new characters to me. But for people who have been reading for a long time, they, they feel extra rewarded because they know them as well. Uh my, sto- my question for, for you, Jane, was, uh, the, so the story seems to follow uh, Stephanie and Carl, uh, and uh, they undergo kind of a murder mystery, uh, and that was, that was very much throughout the whole story. What was the, the thinking behind why you wanted to tell a murder mystery here, and uh, how do you plot it? Do you know the, the twist at the end and then write it, or are you writing and figure out the twist later? Um. I wanted to do a murder mystery because the setup for Stephanie and Carl is they're different than most of the characters in the Honorverse in that they're not military. Mm-hmm. Uh, they belong to the Sphinxian Forest Service, which is closer to a police department um, on the planet Sphinx. And so obviously we weren't going to have them crashing spaceships all over the place. We could. You could, <laughs> right? No, Jake, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wanted a story where the tree cats would be involved because one of the things 
that is really important to the series Weber and I are doing is we do a lot more with the tree cats who are the indigenous inhabitants of the planet Sphinx than can be done in the spaceship books because we're actually on the planet. So I wanted to come up with a plot where we would have a murder mystery where, in a sense, Carl and Stephanie's sensitivity to the tree cat's ability to read emotion would make them suspicious of what everybody else would simply have dismissed as a suicide. So it's, it's the kind of story that can only be told by those people. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a really important thing for any story is that it's, it has to be unique to those characters and their abilities. As for knowing who done it in advance, um, I sort of evolve as I go along, but Weber and I had talked about you know, what would, in a very small community, trigger that kind of thing. Greed would be the obvious reason, so then coming up with somebody who wanted to get their hands onto resources. Uh, well, I don't want to provide too much of a spoiler. But, so yeah, I did know where we were going, but, it, but really the genesis point was a murder mystery where the tree cats and Carl and Stephanie's sensitivity to the tree cats cue them into something that no one else would figure out. I, I did appreciate that there's a kind of familiar aspect to it where these are very young characters, and so it's natural that they would think, hey, there's a murder going on here, and everyone else is like, okay, guys, we, okay. And so they, it's, it's natural that they'd be written off. So that kind of hooks the audience in and anchors it. But the having the tree cats be basically point-of-view characters, I thought was great because I was really, it was jarring. And so it, it, I had to rethink how I was reading the story. And I thought, you know, this is something that's not done very often. It felt to me as if we were able to read from, like, R2-D2's perspective in Star Wars, where you know he's a very sentient character, but you don't really know exactly what he's thinking. And so this is a cool way to get into these um, the tree cat's minds, uh, which I really appreciated. Um, uh, when you were writing this, uh, was there, I don't know if you guys do this, or I know some authors do this when they do tie-in work, but was there like a specific novel or novella or, or something that you read uh, in the Honorverse or something else that was like, I'd like to, to, to piggyback off of this idea, or was it 100% original? Oh, oh, oh my. Oh okay. My. And, the, and developing Carl and Stephanie. I really wanted to get them off stinks and seeing more of the planets in the system. So that was, that was my impetus. Right. You know, moving, moving my people along and letting them become expanded. Uh, and then my, my last question for you is, I noticed that you have a new novel, uh, House of Rough Diamonds, um, from your Overwear uh, series coming out in paperback in September. Um, uh, would you like to, or can you give a pitch for what that series is, the, the subgenre, and uh, why people should read it? Okay, very briefly, um, it, the, the Overwear series is a portal fantasy in which instead of the main characters being teenagers, they're uh, women of a certain age. The youngest is in her 50s. Um, and it was my desire to take on the idea of writing a story with mature characters going somewhere else to take on the challenge of what would it be like to be a mentor rather than the person being mentored. Mm -hmm. And um, then I just enjoyed creating a fantasy world in which uh, we, I could throw the humans out the window and make everybody non completely non-human because that's often where I'm happiest. <laughs> I think one reason Weber may have asked me to work with Stephanie and the tree cats a long time ago was because he knows perfectly well that I like non-humans an awful lot. Uh, so how's it from... Changer, still my favorite book. Well, no, Brothers of Dragon. All right. <laughs> my two favorites. But, but I, I like non-humans, and um, so putting together a fantasy world where everybody is non-human was a lot of fun, too. Well, I, want so, you, I, I want you to picture a book in which, at the end of it, the wet diaper is complaining to the heroine. 
That's okay. the end of Brother to Dragon's Companion. I just, I just want you to picture that and then go read Brother to Dragon's Companion to Owls. Yeah, I'll just say it. <laughs> that's my first published novel. I, I'm weird. I'm weird. It's okay. Well, I, 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 ap- I appreciate doing an entire novel without humans in fantasy because mm-hmm. so many fantasies now are exclusively humans or they're abandoning fantasy type races uh, in their books. That's the, the trend I've seen. So it's nice to see that, well, that there is still... I, then you may enjoy the first book. Yeah. The first book in the series is called Library of the Sapphire Wind and House of Rough Diamonds is the third. All right. Thank so you. So thank you. Yes. Um, I am putting that on my TBR to buy. As that should be TBB to be bought. Um <laughs> My next question is for Mr. Cot. Ouch. I always forget. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so my first question is, how did you get connected with Mr. Weber and the Honorverse? Well, I'm one of the founders of the Chick Honorverse fan club, and I've been friends with David since 2010 or something like that, give or take. And I think it might even been earlier than that, yeah. <laughs> We talked on Bane's bar before that, I think. Yeah. And I think we first met in, in, at the convention in Birmingham, UK, in 2011. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that might have been. Yeah. Was that before the, the, the first the first? Yes. Trip? It was okay. before the first trip because I first met you, and then later I met also Sharon, and you were alone in Birmingham for some reason. Okay. Yes, no, it was called Three Small Children. <laughs> so, so your uh, novella is called The Silesian Command. I hope I said that right. Um, uh, it's featuring the character of Eve Chandler uh, as she's leading uh, a force in Silesia against a certain pirate. I'm going to say which pirate it is in case that's a spoiler. Um, uh, my, question, my first question regarding the story specifically is, why did you pick Eve Chandler as the character and why did you pick Silesia as the, the setting for the story? Okay, so I'll answer the second question first. I, I just always enjoyed Silesia, and for those of you who don't know, Silesia, or as we call it, Slesko, is part of the Czech Republic and Poland. Historically, it's been a region that's been going back and forth between the two empires. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's part of, like, half of Silesia is in the Czech Republic and half is in Poland. And so it's, if you are a Czech reader and you read Silesia, you, you laugh and you say, oh, wow, that's cool. And, and then it's like, well, also I like this idea, it's like corrupt and it's sort of failed state and we read it and say, oh yeah, that's kind of accurate. And, <laughs> and, and so I always like to let you know, and I, of course, in reading Honorverse novels, I really enjoyed uh, Honor Among Enemies, I think it's the one that takes most, the first one that takes most of its time in Celestia, right, David? It was the first one. I yes, think. that is the first novel that does. Yeah, and, and so I, when the opportunity came along, it was like natural choice. I said, you know, I want to do Celestia, and especially in the later books, we know it's been annexed by the Star Kingdom, or half of it was annexed by the Star Kingdom. We know that Admiral Sarnoff is there. And we only hear about it, and we never see it. So I said, yeah, it would be a good place to see and visit and see what's going on. And we haven't seen Admiral Sarno for a long time. And so I said, yeah, let's, let's meet him. Let's see what's going on in Celestia. Because it's, I think in the, in, a, in the mainline books and in the Saganami series, it's been always like, yeah, we don't get these cruisers because they're going to Celestia. And <laughs> yeah. this big trouble in Celestia. So I said, well, let's explore Celestia. I think that's one of the... To the first question, yeah. I think uh, there were actually two drafts. The first one was the one I submitted before the long hiatus, and that one was longer because oops. And, <laughs> and I think the main character was different. And then as I had some time to think about it, and when David approached me for the second draft, I said, well, can I use Eve Chandler because... Uh, I did Eric Flint a little bit because Eric picked Anton Zildicki from the earlier book and made gave him a character because he, Anton did not really have a character in the uh, on um, Short Victorious War. It was just one scene with that character. And I said, well, I know that Eve Chandler was 
owner's tactical officer and later exec on the Nike, and then we sort of we don't see her. So I said, hey, can I use Steve? And David said, sure. And, and I did that, and I enjoyed it, and I gave her a backstory, and, and I gave her something bad happening to her in the past. Let me, let, let, me, let me throw one thing in here that, that Jan really picked up on well here. One of the things that's important to me if I'm going to write military science fiction is that there's a cost involved mm -hmm. for the people who are paying the price out on the front line and everything. And he was able to do that with Eve in a way that was not something that happened directly to her but that was just as devastating and traumatic as anything could have been. Um, and he did it very, very well, I thought. Um, it's not that I want these stories to be downers, because I don't, but I do want people to... The last thing in the world that war should be is glorified. Mm -hmm. The next to last thing that it should be made is you can get through this without getting hurt and without hurting other people. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why so many characters die uh, in the Honorverse. And it's also the reason that Honor Harrington doesn't regenerate. Um, it's the only reason that I decided that she didn't regenerate, because if she was wounded, I wanted her to have to deal with the wounds, not, okay, six months in PT and I'm back on my feet. Well, uh, I did appreciate that this one, it, it did have those military sci-fi feels. Um, uh, it did feel very, I would say, Clancy-esque um, for Tom Clancy's uh, novels. Uh, and w one thing I appreciated was it felt very layered because you didn't just have a simple, your, 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 your hero or heroine is f uh, following or, or attacking the pirates. There were political discussions on the planet uh, where there were p people, I believe it was some engineers who weren't wanting to comply, some pilots who weren't wanting to comply. And so they had to deal with this external threat, but they also had internal threats at the same time. And the book did a good, the story did a good job of uh, sh con contrasting the two and showing how sometimes you have to compartmentalize which threat's more important. Uh, what was the, um, without getting into spoilers on who the, the pirate is and stuff, can you tell why you specifically... Uh, chose a pirate type storyline and how you were able to move the pieces around in the story, like the characters in the different ships. I, I think, again, answering the second part of the question first, <laughs> this is just natural of the things that I like to read and what, what I write. You know, I always like compartmentalized stories and different viewpoint characters and different plot lines going at the same time. So that just came natural. And I think you can tell that the, the story was like larger around it because the, the first draft was slightly larger and like and, and as for the for the specific pirates I know or we knew that there's there are some revolutionary groups in Celestia and I thought also I think this is not a spoiler when I said there's like a ex Havanite uh, SS officer in charge of one of these groups because it's like told on almost at the very beginning and I I am thinking of him as someone with, I originally called it Napoleonic Complex, but then thinking of Honor versus actually Gustav Anderman Complex. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point in the story, someone actually says, well, he cannot get away with this, can he? And someone else says, well, tell that to Gustav Anderman, he got away with it. Right. And 500 years down the road, we may call this guy another Anderman, you know. And I liked that. I, did, I do remember the person making that comment because I remember liking that because it did a good job of connecting um, uh, to the other story the, that was featuring Gustav Andermann. And so uh, sometimes you, do, you, you aren't always able to make connections whether you have a collection like this and when you have, you know, it happening over the course of hundreds of years. But when you can make a connection like that, that is always appreciated. Um, uh, my next question is, do you have any future projects coming out, any prose or other type of writing projects coming out in the future? Um, on the Czech market, I have some books that are coming out. I think my 19th and 20th books are going to be published in the next few months, but that's on the Czech-speaking market. But on the English-speaking market, I my four uh, space opera novels of the 
series that we call the Central Imperium, they are going to be republished by a bigger publisher. And, and so right now we are, what we are doing is that I just finished proofing translation of sh some short stories of that universe, which are going to come out together as book five. And I've just discussed it with my American editor. And I think you, some of you know him, Walt Boyd. And, and we, we suggested doing a framing story on that in taking page from Lois McMaster Bujold's idea with Borders of Infinity, where she had like several novellas connected by a framing story in that. And so that's what we are going to do for book um, five. And I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. And it's, it's like smaller stories from that universe. And I'm not sure if anyone will enjoy reading them, but I definitely enjoy writing them. And, OK, thank you. And, and yeah, and on the Czech market, sort of American connection is my second anthology with Joel in it is going to come out soon because the um, the Czechland series, which is my big alternate history series on the Czech market, is an anthology with various authors and one of them is Joel Presby, who is a trooper and managed to write a wonderful story without him, without being able to read the main, main series. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's impressive. If you if you physically can't read the series, okay, that's still that's still still impressive. Uh, so that's a that's a great transition opportunity. So my next question uh, is for Miss Presby, um, Joelle. Uh, so my first question is, how did you get connected with uh, David Weber and the Honorverse? Well, first of all, it is all my husband Andy's fault. Um, Always. Uh, oh, oh, always blame, always blame the man, right? So uh, Andy is wonderful, and among his his wonderful attributes is he has degrees in spacecraft systems engineering, which science fiction authors like to collect that kind of person and have them available as tech support. And and David Weber is great at, at collecting tech support people who are who can be helpful. And so uh, Andy was helping David and. There is this uh, story universe you might have heard of, the Honor Harrington universe, and it, it, it sells a little bit well, you know? Um, Tony Weisskopf at Bain wanted to have a special fictional, nonfiction companion sort of thing uh, to come out for the 20th anniversary of On Basil's Station. And so the idea for the Honorverse companion was born, and David turned to his, his tech support people and said, please help make this fictional, non-fiction encyclopedia happen. And, and Andy was very excited and, and he got friends together. And I believe, Jan, that you were part of it at that point too, at the very beginning. No, not yet, not until later. Yeah. Okay, um, so, so nine people got together and actually formed a corporation in order to sign a contract. But then Andy had a new job. He, I was out of the Navy by that point. I'm a former Naval officer, but he was still in, and he was not having the time to do it. And so, well, the Presby name was on the on the contract, and so I, I stepped in and started helping. And one thing led to another. Um, we got the book out, and I was very happy with it. And it seems that David was a little bit happy with it too, and so was Tony. And then there was an opportunity to write a honorable short story to go on Bain.com. Letters to help from advertise this, and I wrote a short story, um, and I'd I'd written a lot before, but not submitted it places, and my story got passed around from one person to the next in this group, including getting handed to Sharon and getting handed to David and then getting handed to Tony Weisskopf without me knowing that it had gone through <laughs> handoffs yet, and then I find out from Tony Weisskopf that she would like to buy my short story. Aww. Oh, isn't that amazing? And so that, that's, that's my origin story with David and the universe. I'm just trying to think, is that a companion that you were talking about? Is that the House of Steel companion? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. So they're, supposed to, they're supposed to be two more of those uh, in the fullness of time, but they are two more of those projects that kind of got caught in the same kind of hiatus the, the anthologies did. I am an incredible bottleneck. Yes, Jane. Yes, I will just say that my copy of In This House of Steel sits by my desk and is referenced a lot when I'm working. <laughs> uh, so thank you for your hard work. The, the, re the reason I asked is because when I got the, the, the 
uh, connection with Bain, and they told me, uh, they said, we want you to uh, interview all these authors. Uh, I was very excited about it, but I realized because I haven't read that much in the Honorverse, I wanted to, to, to bone up on, on some of the material. And at my local used bookstore, they had a really battered copy of House of Steel, and I knew that they did. So I, that same day, I immediately ran out there and grabbed it. So it's, it's on my shelves over there. I can't grab it now, but I gra- immediately grabbed it. So when you were talking about this companion piece, I was like, oh, I have that. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, so you have a story, which I think you win best uh, title, which is If Wishes Were Space Cutters. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, it very much stands out. Uh, and this is a story that focuses on Noah, I'm going to guess Bedlam is how you yes, pronounce it? Yes. Okay. Noah Bedlam, a poor citizen of Grayson uh, who tries to both get a job and at the same time tries to keep his mother from getting cut off from, for lack of a better term, government, government subsidies. Right, right. And so he's trying to navigate those two things because you, you do one thing, it might cause the other. I, I thought that was a fascinating concept. Um, uh, why did you choose this type of story with the the government themes and also the uh, working to build yourself up themes? Um, a, a thing I have enjoyed doing during my opportunities to write in the Honorverse is this is my third Honorverse short story, or I guess technically it's a novella. Um, they are all related to each other. So that first okay. thing on Bain.com... Um, was a story about um, the Grayson Space Navy, including uh, one of Noah's cousins. And um, in that story, the bad guy is Sully Rustin. And then the next one in Worlds of Honor 6, Noah is the bad guy. Oh. And so I was delighted with this story to have the opportunity to explain where these bad guys are coming from. And in Sulia's defense, in the first story, she is only a little bit of bad guy. <laughs> she, she, so I felt like to make her redemption matter, I had to make her a whole lot worse before she could <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say also that one of the things that Grayson is very different from the template of most of the Honorverse in that it was isolated for like a thousand years. It was originally a religious, fundamentalist religious planet, but with an interesting, the doctrine of the test, which kept it from becoming a closed and unthinking, but very conservative. There are reasons uh, that the birth rate is hugely skewed and why the, uh, there are like three or four women for every man. Um, it's a genetic defect that is kind of baked into them to survive their planet. Um, but, no, 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 it is, it's a genetic <laughs> defect, okay? I'm Wait, sorry. Male, male babies die at a high rate. That's usually yes, that's what I, I did. Know, okay. but. <laughs> but what I wanted to say is it, after encountering Honor Harrington, they sort of got kicked in the rear, and they're 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 adjusting. They're trying to adjust. This story is set as part of that period, and the naval officer, the cousin that uh, Joel is talking about, is a lower income female officer in a navy which had been exclusively male, only what ten years earlier. Joelle, I can't remember the exact she's time. She's one of the first, not the first, but one yeah. of the first. Yeah, and and see, there's also, I have a character who is like a Stedholder's daughter who is an officer. Joelle is the other side of that sociological coin. The other thing that should probably be said is that in many ways, even though they have an economy where they, they buy, they sell, whatever, in many ways the universe is approaching uh, a, a, a non-scarcity uh, economy. Uh, Grayson definitely is not, has not been. It is acquiring modern technology, and that's a big part of what's going on in the background of this story as well. And Joel, I thought, has captured that really well. I, I do remember in, uh, I believe it's the second Honor Harrington novel, um, uh, the... The Honor of the Queen. I believe that one takes place on, on Grayson. And yes, that, it does. Of the, of the Honor Harrington stories that I've read so far, 
that was one where the the settings, the the, the location of Grayson really stood out to me because the uh, the descriptions of how men and women interacted, the descriptions of what their culture was like, was very um, uh, distinct. And so it worked very well. And you see that same world building. It Even though it's not the same author between you two, the, the world building transitioned over. So when they talk about uh, different things in this book, that, uh, or sorry, in this novella, I was able to follow it. So that's a good job that you guys, it, it seemed connected well. Um, uh, and eventually, uh, this story leads to him eventually kind of navigating that, finding a job, but kind of protecting his mother at the same time. And I wanted to ask, when I was reading, I made a guess. Is that what the cover image from this story, uh, from him when he goes into space? Yes, yes. David Battingly did that. that that's, that's Deacon right there. Okay. <laughs> I, I, sometimes with these, it's, it's a, referring to a very specific moment, and sometimes right. it's just a general, they just tr- right. draw something. David, so. David, Batty, David Battingly is, is wonderful. There are, there, his covers are very distinctively his but he's really good about looking for a specific moment within the book that he can use for the cover. Um, and on the first, uh, the first four, five honor Harrington novels, I had four or five different honors because we had not yet settled in on one artist, um, and he has done a remarkable job of maintaining consistency all the way through this series. So just a shout out to him. It, it, it definitely grabs you as a cover. Um, uh, I, I do appreciate it. Uh, with your, your story, uh, uh, Joel, uh, there are political themes in there. And anytime you're writing in a science fiction universe, uh, someone's worldview is bound to be a part of it. But you always want to be careful because you want to appeal to, to mass audiences. And I think this story did a good job of it. it, it is able You're able to discuss themes uh, that might be political themes without, I don't think you touch, I don't think you stepped on any toes or anything. Uh, when you're writing, is that something you're very cognizant of? Or did you just write and it just happened to work out that way? Um, there, there were drafts that, that were not this polished, that were... Were, were shouting too much and needed to be, <laughs> be toned down and and things that I thought were in there, but the, the beta readers said, I, I don't know why you thought that was in there that wasn't in there. And so I got a, a lot of people giving me very detailed, very harsh feedback, and I, I'm quite pleased with how it turned out. Oh, good. Um, my last question for you is you have a new novel called The Dabare... Dabare? Snake Launcher, um, yes. Snake Launcher, okay. Um, uh, which came out in November of 2022. Um, I've seen a lot of marketing for it recently as we're recording this. Um, uh, I believe it's, is it, is, am I right that it's your first solo novel? It is. It is my very first so- solo novel. Um, it uh, is about building a space elevator. Um, as I've mentioned, I have a somewhat unusual background. Um, I was born in France and grew up in West Africa, uh, but then I went to the Navy and was in naval nuclear engineering uh, and then government consulting, business consulting afterwards. So I got to pull on a lot of my background to write this story of how a, a big business would have people at the top who were like, yes, we're going to do this. This is going to be the modern wonder of the world. And people in the middle would be like, well, how am I going to promote myself in the company when this surely fails? And then, other yes. people around the planet who need to be hired to have contracts to do this and how, okay, the big company might think that they can keep doing this based out of Berlin and based out of Atlanta, but the reality of how the earth works is you need to have this near the equator at one point and you need to have at least another spaceport near the equator, and, and that is not Germany and the United States for those locations. Right, right. Oh. It's a terrific book. Um, she's she's just she does such a great job with all of the different cultures that intertwine with the question of uh, the West African characters come from a culture that nepotism is not considered a problem, mm-hmm. and yet uh, <laughs> and yet they're dealing with Europeans who autom- automatically consider it a problem. 
And my one of my favorite characters is the human resources guy who absolutely knows his family are really the best people to do the job. And he's got to figure out a way to make sure nobody finds out it's his family. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's terrific. It's wonderful science and it's wonderful people and a snake goddess thrown in just... <laughs> What else could you need? I know. I mean, it's it's a terrific book. It's probably one of my favorite. It's definitely my favorite science fiction read of this year. Oh, uh, you're just Mommy it. Wata wants to send descendants of her people up into space. Who are we to stand in the way? Exactly. Exactly. I just loved it to bits. It, man, you're, you're, you're doing a good job uh, selling it because I'm, I'm really interested in it. And uh, I'll put the cover on the screen in, in the editing, but man, the cover for this thing, I, I, I really enjoyed it. That yeah, really did a great job. Works very good. Yeah. So uh, I'm now going back to Mr. Weber uh, to specifically ask about your uh, story, First Victory. Um, this is the last story in the collection. Um, it features, I believe it's Honor Arrington's parents. Am I right about that? Alice. Allison and Alfred, yes. Okay, good. Um, uh, there's so many Harringtons in the universe, I wanted to make sure I was right about that. Um, uh, and it follows them as a, a young couple, as they're going through life, and specifically how their parents react to their marriage, and how that does... Sometimes Sometimes that doesn't always... Uh, they, they're not always entirely happy about the situation, uh, and so what was the hook for deciding to make this kind of family drama the central uh, aspect of this story? Well, family is very central to my writing, generally, if you look, actually look at it. I mean, you know, people think of me as blowing up starships and whatnot. <laughs> but, I mean, from the very beginning, you've been meeting Honor's mother and, and her father. And my I, one of the reasons that Jane and I are doing the the YAs is I have very strong feelings on how YAs should be should be presented, how they should be structured, and I despise dystopian YAs. I despise books in which to give the kids agency, you have to make every adult either evil or a fool, uh, kind of thing. So that's always been in my thinking uh, while I, when I'm building a character or or a universe. And Honor Harrington is the product of a remarkable pair of parents, uh, which is one reason she wound up being a remarkable human being. Uh, You find out later that there's more genetic modification in her background than even she or her parents knew, uh, which also contributes to some of it, including the downside of her personality, which is the, you have upset me and I'm going to remove your head and insert it into your anal orifice. Um, she does have a temper, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And at several points in the series, she basically says, under the wrong set of circumstances, I would be a monster. Mm-hmm. That she has this, 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 this aspect of her personality that she has used for beneficial means, that in the wrong, wrong set of, of factors would have made her an absolutely horrific uh, uh, person. And it's largely because of her mother and her father that she, and, and Nimitz, but more Allie and, and Alfred, really, in a lot of ways than Nimitz, that she is who she is. Um, and in the previous anthology, immediately previous anthology, you got uh, Allison and Alfred meeting one another. And this story begins almost immediately after that story ends. So there's a continuation of the story that I wanted to tell. Um, one of the things that is at, on, on the Beowulf side of her family, Honor is effectively royalty. Mm-hmm. Okay, and But she was not brought up that way. She was brought up as a yeoman's daughter who didn't know about politics, didn't care about politics, didn't want to know about politics, and that was her mother's doing because her mom was desperate to break out of the, you will be a physician, you will be right. this, you will be that. Um, and the fact that she fell desperately, deeply in love with Alfred Harrington, who saved her life under really ugly circumstances, one of the things that she was worried about is that Alfred would think that she saw him as her parachute out of this situation Mm -hmm. that she was in, but because of the link that they share, she knows that he really understands. Okay? 
Um, but Allie is one of my favorite characters in the entire series. And one of the reasons I did the story in which she and Alfred met is that Honor is not the most dangerous Harrington. Okay, Alfred is. And that's why he's a doctor. Because this is how he's dealing with the same genetic trait that Honor has. Uh-huh. And this was an opportunity for me to build on that and, and kind of unpack that for the reader a little bit in a way that I hadn't been able to do in the mainstream novels. Um, but also, I like these people. <laughs> okay, I mean, I really do. And, and uh, Alfred, uh, Allison's mom... God bless her. Okay, all she wants is the best for her daughter. The problem is that she thinks she knows what the best thing for her daughter is, and she's not interested in hearing her daughter's opinion of what's best for her. Um, and I've known people like that. And I've seen relationships that didn't get put back together, uh, that just, you know, were totally destroyed by a situation like this. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, I kind of visualize this as the anchor for the, 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 this anthology because Beauty and the Beast had been the anchor for the previous anthology. So there's a parallelism uh, going on here. And it was, I've done enough combat-heavy uh, fiction. Um, every once in a while I like to do some that's not. If, if, if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, the battle that Alfred and Jacques fight in this is just as hard mm-hmm. as any battle anybody ever fought in a starship, okay? The, 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 the casualty total may be lower, but the struggle is just as hard. Okay, and I, I, I really, 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 I wanted to write this story for Alfred's conversation with Honor at the end of it. Okay, I mm-hmm. won't won't go any further than that. But yeah, that was this whole story in a way was heading for that that conversation. It felt very much emotion infused. This this may not have had the tension of military warfare, but this was a very tense story because you want them to reconcile. You want the family to be you want them to be okay that they moved on, but you also want them to still connect and and get to see the grandkids and all this stuff. And so you have all this uh, from a reader's perspective that you want to see happen and it propels you forward because you just have to find out do they reconcile or not. And that's a good way of using using tension there. One of one of the biggest mistakes that people who want to write military fiction make, and they make it over and over and over again, is they decide it's about the war and not the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Every good story is character driven. There may be plot devices that are constraining where the character can go and what those that character's options are, but what you care about are the characters. Okay, you can have a totally satisfying story in which there's not a single shot fired and all you're worried about is a mother reconciling with her daughter and getting to hug her granddaughter. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can have, and it can really, really work. You can have another one where characters save the universe and at the end of the day you're kind of ho-hum because that's all that happened. They saved the universe. Big deal. Okay, Um, it's... One of the things that I try to deal with, for example, in the politics in my books, is, yes, you have absolutely rotten people who are, some of them are ideology-driven, and that's why they're rotten. Some of them are just corrupt individuals, and that's why they're rotten. But to me, what's critical is that most human beings are human beings, and most human beings are good or bad. And that is why all the way through the Honor Harrington novels, there are good guys on the bad guy's side. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because there are good people on the other side of that divide. And just because you're wrong, in my view, doesn't mean that you're evil, Mm -hmm. unless that's the way that you're going to react to me. Okay? Um, And that's one of the things that I try to do in the universe as a whole, and which I think my collaborators are also doing, 
Um, and and to me, that's the reason to write. Okay, and I'm a historian by training. I don't know if that shows, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, but all the all that minute uh, minutia that you get into, I, I would never know. But that that's why I I go the ways that I go. It's also one reason why I have so many characters mm-hmm. in. Uh, okay, there are no secondary characters in my novel who are just the lieutenant. Mm-hmm. Okay, if this character is going to play a part in the storyline, then that character has a name and that character has some background that I know about, whether you can see it or not in the books. And one of the things that, that means is I have an incredibly deep bench. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Anton Zawicki, Eve Chandler, um, there are a lot of characters in there. And given how many I tend to get killed, um, I, I need... Uh, a deep bench, and that's another thing that's important to me as part of that price paying uh, is the holes that it tears in my characters' lives. And if you don't know these people, when they lose them, it doesn't mean anything to you. Um, so the the I, that reminds me of how uh, Robert Jordan, uh, when he was writing The Wheel of Time, he had all these characters, the main characters, and then uh, after he died and Brandon Sanderson took over, he was looking through his notes. And there were 200 characters that were part of this party that was moving around. And each one of them had a full-on backstory that Robert Jordan had written. And it had nothing to do with the actual plot. And he never ended up actually using any of it in the writing. But he had it because he wanted to know what those people were that were going along as part of the party. And that seems to see a similar idea. If if you've done your job right with a character, you don't have to ask yourself in a given situation what this character's going to do. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you know that character well enough that given the circumstances you've placed that character in, the character will tell you what that character is going to do. Um, And to me, that's sort of so self-evident that I sometimes have trouble understanding that other people don't understand that, Mm -hmm. if if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and, and I do, I do like that you talked so much about character as writing, because, uh, if, if you have flat characters, it's really hard to sell a story. Not every plot always has to be amazing to me as a reader. Not every world has to be the most extensive world building, but if, if the characters are interesting, that alone will, will sell, sell you on the idea. So I do appreciate that. Um, uh, quick, I'm going to go round round table. Uh, f- uh, if you each have uh, in places online, maybe a Twitter account or something where people uh, can follow you or see updates on books and stuff, I'll go with Miss Linscold first. Do you have a place like that? Uh, yeah, I have a website www.jaylinscold.com. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook, and I have a blog. I post. Faithfully, and have done so for 11 years now, every Wednesday and Friday. So Wow. Um, and if you like cats and guinea pigs, you can see pictures of my cats <laughs> and guinea pigs uh, uh, on, my, on my thing. So that's where I, you can find me. That's where I met, I met Joelle online. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect uh, segue. Joelle, where can people find you uh, online? Uh, I... Uh, you know, when when the woman has the way to do it, that's the way to do it. JoellePresby.com. Just my name. <laughs> my name on all the social media apps. Okay. That's, that's unique enough that you don't have to... There's, there's not a jo- another Joelle Presby that's like, darn it, she beat me to first. No, I, I, I got that before that other Joelle Presby, whoever she might be. <laughs> all right. Just out of luck. <laughs> and then Mr. Katuch, um, uh, where, where can people find you? Uh, I'm active on Facebook. I have both my author page and my private profile. You can just type my name and it will show up. There are not many of us with this, with this name. And I have my author's website, which is jan kotouchcz That's for Czech Republic. And I have the dash because there was another Jan Kotouch who pulled that <laughs> website for uh, that's for him. It hasn't been updated in 15 years, but he refuses to yield it or whatever. So. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's frustrating. But thank you. <laughs> Mr. Weber, how about you? Well, I have davidweber.net, which I have not been on anywhere near as much as I should. 
Um, I'm active on Facebook. I'm actually more active on my personal page than I am on the author's page. Um, I have... Uh, Actually, I have DavidWeber.net because somebody else had already bought DavidWeber.com and wanted a mere $50,000 to get my name back. So I wow. said, I could make this work without DavidWeber.com. But, you know, <laughs> uh, but um, I really do need to, to do a better job of my social sites than I do. But life has been so incredibly crazy uh, that I am basically just sort of writing the rapids right now um you i have on the display with you with me right this minute you have two people who are doing collaborative novels with me right now and who are having to deal with the reality of my bottlenecks <laughs> okay um and um Jan is uh, also going to be writing uh more in the honorverse here uh very soon maybe um, we should support the group <laughs> yes, you really do need a support group. So, say, say, you can call the group. Right, Where's Dave? Dave? Where's Dave? <laughs> Where's Dave? <laughs> You've been much better this book. You've been much, much better this book. Yeah, well, Joelle, see, I've been better for you. That Joelle's getting paying for it over on her end. <laughs> yeah. but, they say nothing. <laughs> yes, but um, one of the things that is is definitely true. I've got to go because I have company coming. Oh, okay. Wonderful to see you all, and thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming on. All right. Bye, Jane. Bye, Jane. Bye, Jane. Bye. I was I was just going to say that one of the joys for me in collaborations is the way in which you get that synergistic effect. Uh, when when you're writing, and it's one reason that on the anthologies, I really really want my my authors to have as much freedom as possible in in the way that they want to construct the stories and and the characters. Um, the same reason that I wanted Tim for the for the Manticore Ascendant novels is I wanted that different flavor, but I wanted it to be different, but good. Okay, and I've been very lucky overall um, in in the in the quality and the caliber of the work that I've gotten um, out of out of my collaborators, both in the novels and in these in these uh, anthologies. The first anthology is the probably the weakest of the lot because this, people were just really starting to get their feet under them and there was not a lot of honorverse out there for people to have read before they wrote their stories if you follow me mm -hmm. um, but by the time we hit number two I think we had kind of ironed out the, pot, the, the rough spots filled in the potholes and I've been very pleased uh, uh, with the caliber of the work that people like Jan and and Joel and Jane have have brought uh, to the to the universe. I'll be 71 in October, um, and that is, I think, also having an impact on my my productivity. As you know, as you get older. But I do think a lot of it is still lingering repercussions from the concussion followed by the COVID. Um, it's just making it hard for me to find the kind of energy that I used to have to 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 drive, you know, to power through, uh, as as it were. I have I am just now finishing up a book that was technically due uh, the end of November, and for me to be that far behind is is unusual. Okay, but on the other hand, I'm four years overdue for the next Safe Hope book um, because that was where the whole concussion and COVID and everything came in. Um, now, that's with a different publisher, but um, there's also that little sequel to Sword of the South, which was due about a year after the Safe Hold book that's five years old. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting, um, but uh, thank you for having all of us, um, and uh, I uh, I hope I didn't run on too long. Oh, no. um, 
I'm perfectly happy. I thank you all for uh, contributing to this conversation. Uh, I, I now want to go buy a lot more books from y'all. Um, uh, you can. Speaking of buying books, you can buy World uh, uh, the World's of Honor What Price Victory in hardcover and ebook um, uh, online. And uh, I really suggest the hardcover. It's really nice. It's it's, it's a really pretty hardcover. Looks good yeah. on your shelves. Um, yes. So thank you all.